Before we begin, I'd like to give a big ol' shout out to Smashterpieces! This opening promo isn't really a commercial, it's just pure nepotism. Smashterpieces is a podcast run by a couple friends of mine over at Nintendo World Report and Anonymous Dinosaur. They're running through one game for every fighter in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate in release order, and Metroid Prime is the game they picked for Samus Aran. Metroid Prime is also the latest Smashterpieces episode to come out, today, and it's also also the Smashterpieces episode that I happen to be making a guest appearance on. Funny how that works out. This video is going to be a compliment of sorts to their Metroid Prime episode, so if you want to hear some additional thoughts about this game from me and Smashterpieces, check it out after the video. Smashterpieces streams their playthroughs every week, and they're genuinely entertaining folks to hang out with for an afternoon. So hit them up on Nintendo World Report's Twitch, check out their Twitter, and have a listen wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, let's take off the shameless advertising hat. A little under 20 years ago, Metroid Prime was released in North America, and five years ago, I declared Metroid Prime to be my favorite game of all time. It was part of the beginning of my favorite games project, which I've since rechristened DQP's faves, where, as you might have surmised from the title, I'd take a deep dive into some of my favorite games of all time in order to interrogate why they wound up that way. Some of those old videos are rather cringy. I've grown a lot in the past five years as a creator, and and you can really see that growth if you go back and compare my more recent videos to my old ones. Woof, I really understated just how much and how early the third game absolutely falls apart, didn't I? Also, ew, that footage looks kinda nasty. I really just recorded that straight from a GameCube, didn't I? Let's, uh, fix that up, uh... Ah, there we go, spick and span. Yep, my latest playthrough of Metroid Prime was in the Prime Hack fork of Dolphin, which allows for mouse and keyboard support, and I am never going back. As much as I loved the Wii remote controls back in the day, I've since become a hardcore PC gamer. And no first person game will ever feel good to me without a mouse and keyboard again. Metroid Prime Trilogy now included. Prime 4 also probably included? someday? I don't even know if that game's real. I also played this in Dolphin VR, but I'll have more to say about that in this Masterpieces episode. TLDL, it wasn't super. Okay, moving on. I made a video about this game five years ago. Let's talk about it. My last video on Metroid Prime is probably one of my weirdest to reflect on because it wasn't really so much a standalone video so much as it was meant to be the endpoint of a long series. Those original 10 Favorite Games Project videos are a fascinating portrait of who I was back in early 2017. We've come a long way. Ain't that the truth, buddy. But let's focus on Metroid Prime for now. The GameCube era was a formative time for me. I still have most of my old GameCube collection, and a lot of them had a deep impact on me growing up. Metroid Prime and Thousand Year Door were hugely influential on me in ways that I'm still realizing today. I was drawn to Metroid Prime, at first, because the cool bounty hunter lady from Super Smash Bros. Melee was on the box, but it later drew me in because it was so unlike any game I'd played up to that point. My game diet as a young kid consisted of a lot of Mario, Pokemon, a dash of Zelda, and licensed games that don't hold up very well, so when my family rented Metroid Prime from our local blockbuster and me and my brother popped it into our GameCube, I was absolutely stunned. I was not used to media being this moody, this lonely, this opaque. Like, as an example, most of the villains in the media I had consumed were like, yeah, we're so evil. Our plans are only one step away from fruition! And I usually saw them gloating about their evil plans early on, blatantly, to the audience. But in Metroid Prime, the first time you see the antagonists, they're bleeding and dying. Their ship is in shambles. They've been experimenting on something. And they Frankensteined this horrible space pirate dragon cyborg together, which escapes right before you as their ship crashes to the surface below. And that's the introduction! That's the first half hour. That was the hook. It was mysterious, it was dark, it was horrifying, and it utterly captivated me when I was 10 years old. Of course, now that I'm older, some of that magic is gone. I can tell that, oh, that's Ridley. Oh, they're invoking the trope of a mad science experiment going horribly wrong. Oh, that opening shot is ripped straight from the first Alien movie's opening shot. Environmental storytelling that you walk through in first person? What else are we gonna steal from Half-Life? Bad platforming? But as a kid? 
That shit grabbed me and grabbed me hard. It seemed like there was no other game, no other story, no other experience like Metroid Prime. The isolation, the lore, the map design that subtly funnels you into discovering secrets in such a way that you feel like you discovered them yourself. I latched onto that quick. I still haven't let go. Metroid Prime also had different expectations of its players than other games did, at least the way I saw it when I was younger. Again, my game diet was stuff like Mario and Pokemon. A lot of it was centered around being the best, beating the bad guy, grow, become stronger, until you are the strongest. Metroid Prime did not necessarily ask that of its players. Its challenge relied more on learning about the world, and I found that really appealing compared to other media that I had played at the time. The game asks you, at the end, instead of beating X number of boss fights, to find artifacts. Some of those artifacts are combat-centric, sure, but the majority of them ask you to remember and think back to previous areas. They're tests of memory, of wit, and like, I know that artifact hunting at the end breaks the pacing and a lot of players don't like it, but I don't know. When I was young, it seemed like an interesting way to cap things off. It still feels that way to me. Maybe it's nostalgia, maybe it's theming, I don't know, but I dig it. Spoilers, it's theming, but that'll be a section in and of itself later. Essentially, if I wanted to boil my old Prime video down, I'd say that it's important to me because there was no other game like it when I was a kid. It made me curious and inquisitive, and those feelings of curiosity and inquisitiveness never really left me. I treasure those. So, I guess I treasure Metroid Prime. Oh, come on, I can come up with a better point than I guess. 2017 DQP did a pretty alright job of summing up why they liked Metroid Prime, but they're five years older now. Surely some new thoughts about my supposed favorite game of all time have arisen. So before I get to the big point, here's some stray feelings that I didn't bring up back in 2017. Let's start with the Space Pirates, since I didn't really talk about them much five years ago. For as much as they suffer at the start of the game, the Space Pirate logs are actually a much needed source of dark comic relief throughout the game. Like yes, they're a terrifying force, and they're super fashy, and they're growing Metroids, which as video game enemies never cease to give me anxiety every time I play this game, but the pirates are also just so f***ing stupid and hilarious. They're a force so full of pride and anger and righteous toxic masculinity that they try and replicate Samus's equipment with comically bad results. Their logs talk a big game about being careful with specimens and testing things as much as they can to iron out any and all flaws, but occasionally you'll read about a phazon related mishap or a Metroid that accidentally mutated into a Metroid with ranged attacks, so they just stuffed it in a cave in the hopes that it wouldn't bother them. Them. I especially love this scan about how they unsuccessfully, lethally tried to replicate Samus's morph ball, and those experiments went exactly as well as one would expect. The space pirates have all the toxic machismo and all the brain cells of a Warhammer 40k faction, and I love them for that. Alright, next stray feeling we should probably have an honest conversation about the level design. The Magmore Caverns kind of… suck? They're not really an area so much as they're an area-shaped bouncer that stands between Fendrana Drifts and literally the entire rest of the game. The only items of note that are found there are the plasma beam, a couple of the artifacts, and the optional ice spreader, and those are all late, 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 late game. So before that point, every trek that you make into Magmore feels unnecessary and like extra padding in between you and the next power-up, especially when the game has you going back and forth between Fendrana and the other areas. You've gotta trudge through Magmore Magmore a lot, pretty much just for the sake of trudging through Magmore. And that's a whole other thing. The game has a bad habit of giving you an item, leading you to the next point on the critical path, and then being like, uh, 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 my bratty little sub, you came too close to the critical path, now mommy's gonna make you backtrack again. I'm sorry, I'm... <laughs> The game has a bad habit of giving you an item, leading you to the next point on the critical path, and then cruelly putting up another impassable obstacle right in front of you, often making you backtrack all the way to the other side of the map, usually through Magmore, to find the power-up you need. So, for example, 
You get the Varia suit after fighting the big boss in Chozo Ruins, you go through Magmore, explore Fendrana for a bit, get the boost ball, but wait, you can't get back on the critical path yet, you need to go back through Magmore to Talon Overworld and get the space jump boots, then go through Magmore back to Fendrana to get the wave beam, and then you fight through the pirate labs and get the super missile and thermal visor and spider ball, and that's all good and well paced. But then you gotta go all the way back to Chozo Ruins, through Magmore again, to get the Ice Beam, then back to Fendrana again, through Magmore again, to go get the Gravity Suit, then back to Talon Overworld again, through Magmore again, to go to the Crash Frigate and phase on Mines. <sighs> So, if you're playing the home game, that's six times, minimum, that you go through Magmore Caverns in the second act of the game with no critical power-ups collected at all in Magmore itself. And again, that's minimum. That's a fully efficient playthrough from someone who knows what they're doing. Like me. Like... Okay, I dearly love Metroid Prime. It's a beautiful, atmospheric adventure with a harrowing and melancholic story. It is still one of my favorite games of all time, if not THE one. But it would be disingenuous of me to say that it is perfect, or without flaw. I can't deny that Prime's backtracking doesn't always feel great. But at the same time, this game came out in 2002. Back then, the word Metroidvania didn't refer to a genre yet. It was just a smarmy nickname for Castle Castlevania games on the PlayStation or Game Boy Advance. Metroid Prime came out in an era before Hollow Knight, or Ori, or Dark Souls 1, or Jedi Fallen Order, etc, etc, etc. Twenty years later, Metroidvania has grown into a full genre and matured as such. In 2002, Retro Studios had a much smaller frame of reference, and many Metroidvanias today have learned lessons from the Metroidvanias of the past. It's not surprising that, as much as I loved and love Metroid Prime, it is relatively janky to play nowadays. And that's okay, it's an old game. Speaking of retro studios, it's also only fair to reflect on Prime's hellish development, considering I did so when I celebrated Metroid Dread back in my top 10 of 2021 video. Metroid Prime's development story is kind of hilarious, but also pretty grim. Prime was Retro's first game in collaboration with Nintendo. No, not just that, their first commercial launch, period. And after years of throwing ideas at the wall and seeing what stuck, Shigeru Miyamoto suggested that they work on Metroid after seeing their FPS engine, and after their four prototypes, four prototypes got scrapped, developers at Retro worked intense crunch hours in order to finish the game. To quote senior artist James Dargy, I think it took us almost six months to do the first level that Nintendo approved, then we had less than a year to do the rest of the game. Can you imagine making Metroid Prime in less than a year? To hell with that, Metroid Prime is more than one of my favorite games of all time, Metroid Prime is a miracle. And again, like I said with Dread, Metroid Prime is a masterpiece in spite of Retro's work ethic, not because of. To paraphrase James Stephanie Sterling, crunch is not an indicator of quality, it's a failure of management. And that's not even mentioning Jeff Spangenberg's very brief tenure at Retro. You should Google it. Maybe don't Google it at work, though. Actually, while I'm thinking of Metroid Dread, I also wanted to talk more specifically about the Chozo. And let's just make that its own section. <laughs> So, these two games didn't publicly exist five years ago, did they? Metroid Prime is a really weird game to talk about when it comes to canon, because future non-Prime games have just kind of ignored the Prime trilogy. Would that really lead to the resurrection of the Space Pirates? Without a malicious force to lead them down that path, wouldn't they continue to merely follow their instincts? ultimately becoming no more than a swarm of feral creatures. Wow, really? I'm sure those feral creatures down in Research Lab Hydra would love to hear you elaborate on that. They sure are good at taking notes. It's honestly a shame that the Prime Trilogy sort of just exists in its own continuity, because Samus Returns and Dread have since introduced a really cool new wrinkle to the Metroid canon, the Machin Chozo. Pretty big Metroid Dread spoilers, by the way. Here's a time code to skip them. It's been no secret that the Chozo were an interplanetary colonial empire. 
This much was made clear as far back as Metroid 2 on the original Game Boy, since their statues are all over this ostensibly different planet from Zebus, and further explored in Prime 1 and 3 by the Chozo presence on Talon 4 and Elysia, respectively. But Metroid Dread, along with the super-secret post-credits unlockable from Samus Returns, lays out that there is a specific faction of the Chozo that is explicitly fascist and wants to take over the universe the Machin tribe. And it might be tempting to brush the Machin tribe off as just the bad Chozo, as compared to the good Chozo Thoha tribe, which are just a bunch of innocent scientists who want to advance technology for the good of civilization. This is how Quiet Robe tries to frame the story. But the presence of the Machin and Thoha at Samus's DNA infusion on Zebus, as well as their cooperation in the past, suggests that the war-torn and bloody history of the Machin had deep roots in Chozo culture itself. The Chozo were part of a colonialist empire, and that political and ethnic dominance was probably a deep part of Chozo culture on some subconscious level. It would take some deep introspection and historical reckoning for the Chozo to come to terms with their violent history and have an honest conversation about it. And it's not hard to imagine that the Machin would rather violently brush that history under the rug and snuff out dissent if it meant that they stayed in power. But it's just a video game, right? It's a Nintendo game. Those aren't political. It's not political. Yeah, suddenly it makes sense that the Talon 4 Chozo were seeking refuge away from the violence of the Machin tribe, huh? Which makes their downfall right before the start of Prime all the more tragic. Like, this is just fan conjecture, but imagine fleeing a totalitarian, expansionist regime only for a Phazon Leviathan to crash into your refuge years later and drive your people into insanity. It legitimately makes the tragedy more heartbreaking. And again, this is just fan theorizing. Retro Studios had no idea about the Machin and Thoha back in the late 90s and early aughts, and Mercury Steam's writers likely did not have Prime in mind when they wrote their interpretation of the Chozo in Samus Returns and Dread. But it unintentionally adds a really sad and also present wrinkle to the Talon 4 Chozo's already sad story. And that brings us to the point. The point of this video, not the last video, the point of this video, I'm sorry. <laughs> Metroid Prime is hard science fiction. That is to say, it is fiction about science. Most other media that we culturally think of as science fiction tends to use a science fiction aesthetic to tell what is usually a fairly traditional hero's journey or fantasy story. But hard science fiction incorporates science into its narrative to tell a story about it. This is something that I briefly touched on in my aforementioned cringy Mass Effect video. That trilogy walks on a tightrope between hard science fiction and more traditional space opera storytelling. And not always gracefully. And when I say that Metroid Prime is hard science fiction, I say that cautiously because I don't think I would describe most other Metroid games that way. I don't know what Yoshio Sakamoto thinks vaccines do, but they definitely do not do in real life what they do in Metroid's Fusion and Dread. I say Metroid Prime specifically is hard science fiction because a lot of its fiction is scientific or at least attempts to be. The vast majority of the game's writing is either spiritual and historical texts written diegetically by the Chozo, or scientific observations made by either the Space Pirates, however poorly, or Samus's scan visor. Almost every enemy scan has some sort of diegetic scientific explanation for their presence on the planet, including the literal ghosts. If the player scans everything in this game, like I do, then they're going to be spending a lot of time learning about the ecology of Talon 4. They'll learn how creatures eat, how they hunt, how they traverse and interact with the environment around them, what steps they take to defend themselves from predators, what kinds of environments they prefer, etc. etc. And as a result, even though not all of the science may be accurate per se, Talon 4 still feels like an ecosystem. It has food chains, diverse biomes, extinction events, and a civilization that at least tried to live alongside it while disturbing as little of it as they possibly could. Chances are good that if you read at least some of the log entries about this stuff, you'll get invested in it. 
you'll start to care about Talon 4 as the ecosystem that it is. Even though it's a brutal and unkind ecosystem, as most are in real life, it's still an ecosystem, and it's still beautiful in its own natural way. The player doesn't just get invested in the environment because it's what the Chozo worshipped, they get invested because they're actively studying it and observing it. And that turns out to be a really good motivation to fight against the forces that threaten to make the planet a barren wasteland, as the pirates estimate in their observatory. A lot a lot of critics at the time, and also today, praised Metroid Prime for being absorbing and dripping with atmosphere, and for most games today, that'd probably ring as pretty hollow praise. Like, well, the game's not terribly fun, but it looks pretty. But for Metroid Prime, that's the entire point. The world is absorbing because the developers want you to care about it. In Metroid Prime, the world is the point. It's what's at stake. That's actually a huge part of the reason why I don't mind the artifact hunt at the end. Yeah, it's a pace killer, I'll admit that, but it's also about the world. It's a test of your knowledge of the world. I think it thematically fits. Metroid Prime directly pits its nature against industry, against the machine of war and conquest. The space pirates may not be feral creatures, but they're still laser focused on how Phazon and Talon 4 can benefit them and make them stronger. They are diametrically opposed to the Chozo who worshipped Talon 4's ecosystem, and they will desolate the planet if it means harvesting more and more Phazon for their own ends. The player, the entrusted one, as the Chozo calls them, stands directly against that machine, to defend Talon 4 from those who would destroy it to further their own warlike industrial ends. Even if the Chozo there have been wiped out, the ecosystem of Talon 4 is still worth saving. And if you haven't figured out why at this point, well, all you need to do to find out why is hold the minus button and gesture the remote upwards. It's all laid out there for you. I lived in Alaska back in 2003, and I still live in Alaska now. The state was and still is known for both its natural beauty and its massive fossil fuel deposits. 2003 and 2022 are both years where the machine of war and conquest is a pretty hot topic in the news, and as horrifying as that machine is, Alaska's government is one that stands to benefit a lot from oil becoming more expensive per barrel as a result of it. So. Yeah, it's pretty plain to see why Metroid Prime was so formative to me. As janky and weird as it is to play today, as much as you could nitpick its more dated design aspects, and as much as it really sucked to make it, it's held up. It was worth it. It's still a game I revisit all the time, and I still recommend it to anyone looking for an awesome planet to get lost in. It's a melancholic, beautiful, and absorbing science fiction masterpiece. It was 20 years ago, and it still is today. Thanks for watching, everybody, and to bookend this video, thanks again to Smasterpieces for letting me guest sit on their podcast for their Metroid Prime episode. I've put a link to it in the description below this video, so please, please, please click on it. Matt and Joe are great. Now, now he's now he's generosa, glorioso, generosa, generosa. Goodbye. And also, also, thank you for tuning into this video. I have a Ko-fi page that's also linked in the description. So if you got a penny for an old non-binary YouTuber, that'd be swell. Okay, okay, I'll, I'll stop. I'm so sorry. But seriously, tips are always nice. Tip your YouTubers. You don't have to be a longtime Patreon subscriber or anything like that to do it. They always appreciate the support.